Hey, have you ever been, um, you ever been given access to something that you had no right to, didn't deserve, didn't work to, to achieve? Um, uh, if you thought l- long enough or hard enough, all of us would probably say yes, right? Um, like I understand, if anybody has access, by the way, parenthetically, if you have access to the messy game tonight, I mean the FC Dallas game, um, I'd like to talk to you after the service, okay? Uh, some years ago, a friend of mine, who's like this Uber Mavs fan, invited me to a game with him, and I knew that he he was like, you know, had spent a lot of money to be in some kind of... Um, inner circle of some sort. Like he knows, you know, Mark Cuban, he knew all the coaches, knew the players. He would even travel with them, like a small group of fans, evidently, elite fans. He would travel with them on away games at times. And so when he asked me to go to the game, I said, well, let me pray about it. Yes. Yeah, I'll go with you. Yeah. That would be amazing. So we, we go into the um, down underneath, like we get to the AAC, where I'm usually walking like two miles. We go under the AAC. Now, some of y'all here, like you're going, yeah, that's where I park, Jeff. I've just never, but I, like I'm going, what? So we go under and he says, yeah, well, this is where the, you know, the players park down here and the coaches, staff parks here. And sure enough, on the way up and back down at, uh, before, after the game, uh, uh, Emmett Smith, is in the elevator with me because um, we're, you know, we're, we're bros. Um, and Alex Rodriguez, somebody know A-Rod. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even belong here. Like, what is happening here? So we go up, we're on floor level. And then we're about few, we weren't in a suite, we're a few rows up behind the, the bench. And, and I'm, I'm like, all of these, like I have access to this, all of this, and I did nothing, right? I mean, like, I know a guy. Like, if has that ever happened to you? Like, well, I just know a guy. That's why I'm here. Because I, you know, at first I was like, man, I don't even belong here. And really throughout. And like, and, he, and then time came to like get something to eat, right? And he goes, hey, whatever you want. Like, you can go over there and here. You can, we can order right here. We, and whatever, it's all paid for. I'm like, who, what, who lives like this? And so we're having a great time. And I realized with all of the benefits of being there, the blessings of being with my friend, the whole time I'm with him. I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing, but this guy, like I, and, and but I, I realized it started to change my behavior. Like I had a little, I had a little, little swagger, you know, I was like, y'all, Dirk, what up? You know, <laughs> like, what? And, and I really, and I'm like, y'all, I'm not, not sitting up there. I'm down here, you know, and, and I say all that. I mean, I was so humbled to be there because of my friend, right? I had no right to be there. Now, if you're tracking with me already, some of y'all are going, okay, this is an analogy, an apt analogy of the entire Christian life. We have access to benefits and blessings that do change our behavior in all the right ways um, because we're living in the kingdom of God. And so throughout the summer, we've been looking at the book of Hebrews. You can go ahead and grab your Bible. In fact, you can turn to Hebrews 12 is where we'll be. Um, we're going to close out, as Brandon noted, close out the series today. But in the book of Hebrews, um, the, the writer has been saying throughout, uh, I know a guy. And as a result, you can know him too. And as a result of knowing him, you have access to all the benefits and blessings that come with, with knowing him. And uh, so in the book of Hebrews, we, we close out today. The entire book has been pointing out the fact that Jesus is better. He's better than, than everything. And today we're going to talk about a key concept that's so important to understand, and that is living in the kingdom of God, okay? Live, what it is to live in the kingdom of God, we're going to look at, sure enough, the benefits, the behaviors, and the blessings that follow, all right? So we've said throughout, this is important, the first hearers were um, a small persecuted group of people, formerly Jews. Uh, they're living in some pluralistic uh, society, we could say a secular society, likely Rome, and uh, their temptation was to go back to Judaism, default mode of the human heart, go back to the law. It's also assumed, and this will come to play today, that they know everything about Jewish history, like the whole redemptive story. They understand the creation, the fall. They understand all about the sacrificial system. They, they know all about the, the exodus and, and all that God has done. We read about in the dwell readings this week. They knew all the details of the tabernacle, the holy of holies, the curtain, the separated. The whole, they know all of this. And, and we're going to see this today. Like we, they're just tracking with them the whole time. 
And this is why we, throughout the summer, it's been challenging, you know, because we have to go, okay, y'all, parenthetically, here's what he's talking about, okay? And we'll do a little bit of that today, but they understood exactly what he was saying. Last week, as we closed, uh, well, entered into the closing with chapter 12, uh, some, of you, some of you were here, perhaps heard Taylor Lowry uh, last week talk about this, uh, the second to the last, therefore, at the beginning of chapter 12, since then, in light of all of this, let's run the race with endurance. And um, throughout, there's been this great encouragement to the people and to us to live this life. Don't give up whatever you're facing. And he says, consider him. Consider what Christ has done, who endured the cross. He did not give up. Be like him. And the big take home for me last week was that his discipline is not out of anger, never out of condemnation. That's what we think discipline is. Discipline is training so that we, we grow stronger and stronger through it all. So what I want to do is dive in first and talk about the benefits, all right? First, the benefits that come by living in a kingdom that cannot be shaken, all right? One of the greatest of all these benefits, of course, is access because of Jesus, our high priest. Now, look at the graphic language that he uses. Look at verse 18, because he's going to make a, he's been doing this. He's going to compare contrast, really, um, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And if you're like, yeah, well, what, what's the difference? Mount Zion became known throughout scripture and into, into the future. It is the, play, it is the dwelling place of God. Okay, that's Zion. Sinai, of course, is where the, the Ten Commandments were given. So look at verse 18. And this, this seems like a strange place to start, but watch this. The real graphic language. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom. Look at the language. And tempest and the sound of a trumpet. And a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Like, and there again, they're tracking with him. They're like, okay, yeah, he's talking about when, when God brought the message to Zion. And it was, this is a holy, I mean, to, to Sinai. This is a holy mountain. And for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So this is a holy mountain. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses himself was scared to death, trembled with fear. He's saying, but not you. Look at this, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels of festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of, love this phrase, look at this, the righteous made perfect. It's the only way that we become righteous. Made perfect because of Christ to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than a than the blood of Abel. Now, you're probably, okay, I think I'm tracking with him most of that, but blood of Abel, that seems like a non sequitur. What's up with that? Abel was the first bloodshed, okay, in history. And his death, what he's saying here is, his, his entire death was uh, a homicide, okay, that was crying out for vengeance. Christ's blood was shed as a proclamation of, of grace, okay? So he says, don't miss the message. He enters into the last warning uh, passage there, the next few verses. Don't miss the message then, because it's come to us in Christ. Don't miss it. Don't do what your forefathers did and miss it out on it. Don't be scared. Christ has come. Look at verse 28. Therefore, here's another therefore. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. With reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire, as Elliot read earlier. He says, hey, look what Jesus has done for you. He, he has broken down the barrier. He's torn the curtain so that you can uh, enter in. This is so key. I, I say all this. You're like, that's a wild passage. Here's the point. The entire Christian life is based on what Christ has already accomplished for us, not what we do for him. We say it all the time. Religion says, do this, then you're accepted. As if you can do enough before a holy God. That's the point here. Instead, grace, the gospel says, no, you're accepted. Now, obey. All of life is a response to what Christ has already accomplished for us. We've said the Christian life is not you get Jesus and then all goes well with you. The Christian life is you get Jesus and he's more than enough 
through whatever you're going through in your life. We see this throughout the writings of Paul. I'm not convinced that Paul didn't write Hebrews, but that's another story. Um, he's going to reference Timothy at the very end, all the things. But um, people smarter than me don't think so. Um, but what happens in all of Paul's writings, all of his epistles, he, he, he offers what we call gospel indicatives first, followed by gospel imperatives. Okay, indicatives in English, they're just statements of fact. So let's talk about who you are in Christ first. Let's talk about what he's done. You're totally forgiven. You're fully loved, completely accepted by him based on what Christ has done, not what you've done. Now let's talk about the imperatives, the commands, the obedience to come, the behaviors. And that's what he does here. So he moves from the benefits that we have, access before God, unlike those formerly who were scared to death because of his holiness. We now enter in because of Jesus who's bridged the gap. So then he moves to behaviors. Look at chapter 13, verses 1. We're going to look at 1 through 9 here, this section. This will be, um, I think, the bulk of, of the sermon where I want you to apply this. This is really applicable stuff as we're looking at what I'm going to call six key distinctives of kingdom people. All right? If you want to write these down, these are powerful distinct, distinctives. And like all of Scripture, this is more relevant than today's news feed. I mean, we're always asking, how can I be a light in the world? And so many Christians, frankly, are getting it wrong. Living in the kingdom, yet here in this world as aliens, uh, as, as exiles in Babylon, we step into life to be a witness to him. And here we find six key distinctives that he lays out. This is so key if you can write these down. Powerful list for this cultural moment, all right? In a, in a growing, consider, hostile, polarized, secularized culture, how do we live as light in this world? The first is radical love. He says, verse one, let brotherly love, this is brotherly, sisterly, love continue. Let love for one another continue. Our community, friends, listen, our church is and should be marked by radical love. That's it. And it's all because Jesus had shown us how to love, but he also told his disciples, you remember this, this word for us out of uh, John 3, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So by this, by what? Love. By love, the way that we love others, they're gonna know that we belong to him. In the kingdom, listen, don't miss this, a lot of believers missing this nowadays. In the kingdom of God, so many, so many people, here's where we get it wrong. So many people think my role as a Christian is to be right. Like just rage against culture and tell everybody what's wrong. Listen, in the kingdom of God, you can be right, but without love, you're wrong. That's the way that plays out. In the kingdom, it's yes, truth matters, but let's live out the fruit of the spirit, then people know we belong to Jesus, all right? So it all starts there. Then he says, here's another mark, generous hospitality, an unhindered, open-handed, and joyful hospitality. Every time we gather, every time we're together, but look at what he says in verse two, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. So it, so it didn't just end here, to stra those you do not know, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, maybe you've read that before. I don't want you to get it too sidetracked here on, oh, angels. Yeah, well, wait, wait, like, are there angels among us right now? Like, what, what's he talking about? I think I saw an angel. I think I ran into an angel one time. Some guy helped me change my tire, and he drove off. I didn't know his name. I think it was an angel. And, and you know, it, is that what he's talking about here? Is this, is this really, it, most scholars believe he's talking about, again, Old Testament reference, he's talking about Abraham who served, who's hospitable to strangers, and sure enough, finds out they're angels. They end up being angels. Now, should we then look around and go, well, I need to serve people and be nice today because one of them might be an angel, right? Like, uh, I don't think that's what's being said here. Is that our motivator? I mean, I know you might have some needs. You might just be homeless, but you know what? You might be, a, you might be, a, you might be an angel, so I think I'll help you, right? I mean, that's whacked. What, what is he saying here? The challenge here is whether he's talking about serving angels unaware could it happen? We see we angels in the Old Testament. We see some in the New Testament. Um, generally around really like uh, the birth of Jesus, okay, um, the resurrection. Most of the time we're terrified by angels. 
Um, sometimes they seem like humans, the gardener in the, you know, at the tomb, those kind of things. But is this just an idiom? Here's where I lean. Is it an idiom or an analogy that basically says, you don't know who you're serving. You don't know who you might be serving. We don't serve people because they might be angels. We serve them because they're in need. And I would even jump to Matthew 25, where Jesus says, hey, when I was hungry, you, you didn't feed me. And when I was in prison, you didn't come visit me. When I was sick, you didn't, you didn't care for me. When I, was in need of, when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And what do the people say? When did, we, when did we see you hungry or in prison? He says, hey, and here's what he's saying. I so identify with those in need. When you serve those in need, in prison, who need clothes and who need backpacks for school, who need all these things, you're serving me. See, the whole point is you're doing this for Jesus. We, we do it and we glorify him. This generous hospitality is because of his hospitality towards us. The point is everyone is created in the image of God. Every person and anyone in need, we seek to help them. And this speaks especially to when, he go, when we go among the poor. Why do we serve places in our city uh, that need our help? Because, because Jesus has commanded us to, but you know what? We're serving him when we do it. And when you go among the poor, have you experienced this? Uh, it's tangible. The presence of Christ is tangible because he's among the poor. That's the way the kingdom goes. When you step into a hospital room, when you go to someone hurting, when we go to our in-home Members, the presence of God is there because that's where he shows up. So selfishly, that's in part why I like to go to those places because I experience the presence of God. And we have so many opportunities here, gang, to do so. Tonight is a next-gen gathering of training. Um, we, we can serve, show hospitality to every young mom and dad who bring children here, and we can serve preschoolers on Sunday mornings. We need more. You can serve our children or our students. Every one of us, I'd ask you, what is your ministry here? We have a ministry that meets every Monday morning that goes to our in-home members, takes flowers from the church, and, uh, and goes, breaks them out to bouquets, and takes them to our members who are hurting, people in the hospital, people who need pray, prayer. You can be part of that ministry. One of our deacons, Deborah Roundtree, leads that. You can find out more um, and contact our offices here. Another ministry is Serving Hands where we have two guys, Dan Young and Ben Jones, both who need more hands, more people to help. Go do odd jobs around people's houses or, or go deliver furniture at Vickery and our friends who, are, are, um, who, who just move into the area and need, need some furniture. We have a unique opportunity to serve one of our sweet families. Many of you have heard uh, about Pike Peterson, who's 13 uh, years old. And we, we're going to have, he, he, just, he was just diagnosed with acute myeloid uh, leukemia. And I was able to go see Pike and his family, pray with them, with Morgan and Taylor this week. Um, some are here this morning, MC and Paul are here today. But we are praying constantly for, for Pike, uh, for Micah, the whole family. And we have the opportunity to be, uh, to be a donor, okay? I hope I'm the one. It's a simple swab test that we're going to do on August 27th. Did you see that? On the 27th, um, where you'll be able to come, it's here uh, in the activities area. Okay, so watch for more about that. I, I, we, we're believing there's a match among us. I mean, could it be right here in this room? We could really help Pike to get better. And ultimately, as we're praying for healing, complete healing, believing that that's the case. What a, what a unique opportunity we have. Well, then, then he moves from, from that to care for the marginalized, okay? Caring for, look at verse 3. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison, as though in prison with them, like as, as though you are in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Now, likely he's talking about Christians who are in prison, literally, and those who are being persecuted. What he's talking about here is empathy. He's saying, care for those in prison as if you were in prison. Help those who are being persecuted or who are hurting, who need help, who need to be lifted up as if you were one of them in their skin and in their body. And gang, we have so many opportunities like this to serve. 
to serve those in prison, you can, again, contact our office. Contact Dr. Kelly Hamilton in our missions office. Uh, we have the opportunity to serve those who've been just out of prison with men of Nehemiah who are going to be with us in the fall. We have a great day planned for our big anniversary celebration in October. You'll hear more about it uh, at the end of a vision series we're doing. And they're going to be here with us. It's going to be lit. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, the next one that he offers here, look at this. Is I'm going to call it biblical sexuality. Yo, this is so big, uh, such a major witness, a biblical vision of sexuality. Look at verse four. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge, uh-oh, the sexually immoral and adulterous. That's sexual Im immoral, that's, uh, the word is pornos. You've heard the word pornea, okay, we get the word porn. It's, it's fornication, you've heard that word. It's, any, it's sex outside of marriage. Of course, adultery is sex outside of marriage. But this, gang, the Christian sexual ethic or vision of sex and marriage is so countercultural these days. And this is a way for us to live out the word of God and, and the purpose of sex. I could say to a secular culture, you don't even know what sex is. It actually means something. And this is for all. Look at what it says, among all. Okay, this is for singles, for teenagers, young and old, for married. The marriage bed is, is sexual intimacy in marriage, right? And, and so we, we dishonor marriage, dishonor God's design for sex in our culture through all kinds of ways, through divorce happens, but yes, through living together, through not preparing for marriage. People prepare the venue more than they do marriage often these days, a redefinition of marriage in our culture, completely dishonored the way of God. And for us to live this radical Vision, a Christian vision of, of, of marriage, of sexuality, uh, of purity is a radical thing these days. So many people think that the sexual, you know, Christian ethic is so out of date, even oppressive. Uh, but I would say that what we need to do, of course, is to show the world that there is a beautiful, beautiful story told among those who say, I'm going to be devoted to a person for life in the covenant of marriage before God Almighty. Because so much is being said nowadays, and so many, you know, everybody throwing rocks at purity culture of the past and all the things, and, and rightfully critiqued along the way. But, but the pendulum has swung so much that now many people think that there's a, as if, I mean, the hookup, hookup culture is all about, you know, I'll, I'll just satisfy myself for a moment, as if there's a separation between soul and body. As if we're disembodied people in a way. And, and what we're seeing in our day is this disconnection from the body. We've got to show the world that there's a be more beautiful and better way uh, that God has created us to honor him. And gang, here's the thing. If, let's, sorry, bold, but we need to say this. If you're, if you're going to have sex with your partner before marriage, think about the message you're sending. You're saying, I'm willing to have sex outside of the marriage covenant. Is that the kind of message you want to send to a person that you're going to devote your life to? And we've got to get back to sexual purity as God intended. Now, I must say this, sexual purity, a noble goal for all of us. It's what God desires for us. But let's go ahead. We can confess we're all sexual sinners. All of us. Jesus said, if you lust after someone else's spouse, you've committed adultery. Wait, what? I mean, he's raised the bar, Right? So we, we need to all agree that, that, that we all are in need of purity and we all are sexual sinners. Jesus, watch this, is our purity. And we need to teach our children and teach one another, okay, sexual purity ultimately is not a destination. It's a relationship with a person who is pure. You catching me? This is, a, this is a, a completely, yes, a, a noble goal. But, but, the, but the thing is, Christ is our righteousness. We're not made righteous because of our sexual purity. We're made righteous by him. We're covered in his righteousness. And people must be drawn in by a vision that attracts them by offering a more appealing and life-affirming position and, and understanding worldview of the body, right? 
So many people have disconnected now the body and our sexuality and we got to get back we got to back up our words with actions and show the world a better way that's what we can do nancy piercy in a great book called love thy body she writes this look at this humans do not need freedom from the body to discover their true authentic self rather we can celebrate our embodied existence as a good gift from god instead of escaping from the body the goal is to live in harmony with the body. And she quotes John Paul Sartre, the great philosopher, atheist, who said this, there is no human nature because there is no God to have a conception of it. Man is nothing else but that which he makes himself. We're seeing a lot of that these days, aren't we? Piercy points out, if there's no blueprint for what it means to be human, if nature reveals no purpose, then it cannot inform our our morality. So you take God, remove him from the equation, and this is what we end up with. But of course we know, we are embodied humans. We are sexed humans. So we're gonna live not according to our preferences or our desires, and yes, can be challenging for many. We're gonna live according to God's desires and bring glory to him, not driven by our own pleasure or our own desire but instead give our our lives over to him and so that we can live integrated, holistic, congruent lives, right? And can I say it? Men dressing up like women are still men playing dress up. And we need need to help people see there's a better and more beautiful picture. Now, before, we're we're often quick to throw rocks at everybody else's sexual, you know, activity or whatever else in their lives and then he shifts to this watch this then he moves next to a warning about materialism Uh uh-oh now he talks about christ-centered contentment it's another mark of of those who live in the kingdom look at verse five keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said i will never leave you nor forsake you look at that why be content because jesus is enough Because Jesus is better than whatever the next thing you want to get, next gadget, next job, next house. Materialism is a major sin because you're saying that Jesus is not enough. How would you know if you're materialistic? Two things. You're not content. You're not a giver. That's how you know. So we can confidently say, look at this, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. He's saying, here's how we mark ourselves as distinct as kingdom people. We don't have to keep up with everybody else. We have enough in Jesus and we live our lives differently. And then the sixth one, the last one is honor and gratitude. With all the rocks being thrown at leaders nowadays, we see it in politics, canceling everybody. We see it in business, among business leaders. We see it among pastors. We see it, you know, if you want to lead, you're probably going to, you know, have some criticism come your way. But look at what he says in verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their, of their way of life and imitate their faith. He's saying, pause and honor those who are godly leaders among you. And we have an opportunity, gang, to honor one of our own, Exhibit A. Uh, in a prayer time this past week with our staff, I brought attention to the fact that Rodney Shell, um, who's our executive pastor here, he's been with us 28 years on Tuesday. And he has been faithful, humble, hardworking, Christ-like among us. He's not in the room, but when you see Rodney, tell him thank you for his great work among us. He has been an example. Because all we seek to do, my first sermon when I came here as your pastor, the very first thing, sermon I preached was, it was my great hope, follow me as I follow Jesus, Paul's words. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because my ultimate calling is to him. Not to a place, not to a position, but to a person. And that's what we seek to do. He says, honor those who lead in a way that looks like Jesus. And then verse eight, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a great verse to memorize, by the way. He says, so if anybody follows after Jesus, they're gonna be consistently faithful, just like him, right? There's nothing new about Jesus, 
Maybe a new understanding of who he is, but there's nothing new about him. C.S. Lewis is the one. I love this quote. Um, All that is not eternal is eternally out of date. And so everything that is Jesus is going to remain the same. He's eternally himself, right? And so we pursue him. We just need to know more of who he is. Memorize that verse. You may already have memorized verse 8. And then it goes to verse 9. And this follows. Look at this. Do not then, I could say, be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. I love that. Not by foods, he's saying really. Not by religion, which have not benefited those devoted to them. And then now he's going to close. We look at the benefits, the behaviors that follow, and now the blessings. And we're going to land this now as we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. High and holy moment for us. Incredible way to end the book of Hebrews is is this new covenant now that Jesus enters into. We're going to close our time with the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Look at verse uh, 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. And again, again, they're tracking with him. What is he talking about? The priest would offer sacrifices. They wouldn't then like take it home and have a barbecue, you know, with the animal sacrifice. They would instead go and burn them outside the city. And he says then, Jesus, look at verse, uh, verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin or burned outside the camp. All right, this is a reference to Exodus 29. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate. We know he was crucified outside the city in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. He's saying he's the better sacrifice. He is the high priest who became the perfect lamb once and for all sacrifice. And then verse 13, therefore, Let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So he's answering a question that nobody's asking. He said, wait, where's your altar? He said, no, we have an altar. Jesus has allowed us to come into the Holy of Holies. And now our, all, our, our sacrifice is a sacrifice of praise. All of life, not just when we gather and sing to him, but all of life is a response to his grace, as we've noted. And so then he says this, verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. I came across this this week, y'all, the the Salvation Army has this incredible tagline. I don't don't know if you know what it is, but it's it's this, doing the most good. I love that. Doing the most good. Uh, That should be the mission of every every church. It's from Catherine Booth, their co-founder, who said, there is no reward equal to, to that of doing the most good to the most people in the most need. That's what we're about. And he says, hey, share what you have. You know, my friend shared what he had with me, right? He had access to all things and spending a lot of money, I'm guessing, right? To have access to go to a Mavs game where you can, let's be honest, escape the world for about three hours, a couple hours. Uh, Jesus gives us access because of his sacrifice once and for all. He gives us sacrifice to all the people blessings and benefits of being saved to live forgiven and now to extend that grace to others to love people freely because gang here's the truth we many of us have access we do I mean it's all relative I get that but many of you I mean when you talk about power when you talk about influence we're talking about power has a lot to do with access and many of us in our church have access to Let's be honest, generational resources, perhaps. Some of y'all are able to go to college or some of y'all got a job because uh, you knew a guy. It's not everybody here, but it's true about a lot of us, particularly here in America, particularly in North Dallas. So how do we leverage our access for others? And that's what it means to be in the kingdom of God, to live in the kingdom. And so the way that we do this is through our ministries, right? Jack Lowe Elementary, we've talked about, Cornerstone, Brother Bills, uh, For the Nations, Thrive, all of these ministries. We have opportunity to leverage our access and to help others, to, to serve them. And what I want to do, I'm going to jump past this next portion where he talks, he's back to leaders and he's saying, pray for us. 
and um, all the things. And now I want us to do this. I want us to set up our time for the Lord's Supper together, okay, before we go. And we've got time for this. We're going to sing a song and we're going to partake of now what is the new covenant, the Lord's Supper. Um, Jesus enters into that space in the Lord's Supper and says, hey, um, you know about the old covenant. And he could say this to the Hebrews, to us. Y'all know all about the old covenant. I'm coming with something altogether new. And it is the new covenant that's made possible through my blood. And so what I want us to do is, um, is to close our, or enter into this time of prayer. Okay, would you do that? Just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I want you to consider the access that you have now to the grace of God. Because of his grace that's come your way. He is, he's the rock of your salvation. He's the rock of ages. He does not change. And because of the access, because of his sacrifice, he's torn the curtain so that you can enter into the Holy of Holies. You can enter into a relationship with God, not with fear and trembling, not because you'll, you fear condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So our high priest Jesus becomes the perfect sacrifice for us. And now, now he becomes the rock of ages, this, this cleft within the rock where we can, we can hide out, where we can be covered in his righteousness, no longer fear, but have relationship with God because of him. Friend, if you don't know him, you can receive him today by faith. You don't have to work your way to him. You're justified by faith in what he has done, not by what you do. Say yes to him and praise him. Lord, we now set our hearts on you, the author, the perfecter, finisher of our faith. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.